So, I would like to give the floor to the first speaker, to the first participant of our discussion. And notwithstanding the fact that you have an unprecedented lineup of high-ranking officials, I will give the floor first to Mr. Jurgens because he represents business uh, env environment, and uh, we hope that he will be the, uh, provocative. Thank you. I am twice as nervous as before because some kind of provocation is expected from me. We have the most democratic government in the world. Uh, you know, the first prime, vice prime minister is waiting, deputy minister is waiting, and we peasants have to start. Now, I am not a diplomat. I have to talk to the, uh, to the heart of the matter. And in 2010, Russia is chairing CIS. We understand the responsibility. Many of you took part in a large summit about uh, the meaning of CIS and the um, significance of all of that. Um, for the economic environment in March this year was held by President Atelli. Now, I thought that everybody talked about the huge experience of exchange of opinions and consultations in the CIS, and a lot of legal matter has been developed. Many, many legal materials have been produced, but business doesn't really see that a lot. Business does not remember that CIS exists as an organization when we work in one of our countries. Now, when this continues, and if this continues, we will be irrelevant, irrelevant. There will be a banking union, perhaps as a forum for the bankers' dialogue, and the rest will disappear. Do we want that? Let's talk. Let's think of what's happening in the world, another spiral of regionalism. Uh, like um, it always happens when, like in Doha round of WTO, these trends appear. It's quite natural when the world is going through the crisis, like now, the architecture of yeah, the world, of the economic structure of the world is changing. We don't know what the new building will look like, but it is obvious that the 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 the, the, uh, the standard for competitiveness is rising. Basic interests have moved to Asia. The abundance of financial resources disappeared. The markets will be narrower. There will be great requirements for the products. There will be more modest fin financing. Everybody will look for the new vectors of growth. Uh, public uh, funds will be involved uh, more vigorously into development, and uh, uh, finance has to be stimulated. Countries can't shoulder it on their own. Everybody is looking for partners. The ideas of free trade in, um, in various trade blocks is consolidating. Uh, the uh, Lisbon Treaty uh, hasn't really justified itself. Euro is struggling. The problems with the EU is not just the lack of discipline of those who look after national treasuries. The problem is that systemic problems have been concealed from civil society. I don't want to show any parallels here, but imagine concealing from the civil societies any problems is a bad idea, and Greece has shown it as no one else. And the problem is that Europe. Uh, that Europe has got carried away, carried away with this idea of surrendering sovereignty. And through these attractive and enjoyable and f fantastic procedures, it's forgotten about stimulating its growth at home. And of course, uh, state um, debt, sovereign debt is growing without any future for for paying them back, now they are going to be consolidating their efforts to avoid destructive scenarios. And what are they going to do? They're going to have for new foreign policy, new foreign economic policy, and that's quite natural. In Europe, it's, this is the neighborhood policy. The European Union has this neighborhood policy, and we in Russia are quite jealous of it, especially we're very jealous because neighborhood May, was qualified as Eastern Partnership. Now, Eastern Europe Partnership is offered to those countries which uh, traditionally all over the world have been considered as those of uh, Russian sphere of influence. I'd like to ask you all, do we want this cliché to exist? And if we don't, the world is different now. We should build trust with our partners, and including uh, the CIS. So Russia should ha be able to offer something to its partners. Let's offer them free trade. Now, if we're against that, then why? If we're for it, then let's discuss what we should do about it. So far, we haven't seen an answer from the CIS that would be in any way clear. 
in the 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 Troika, Russia, Belarus, and Kazakhstan have. Um, made titanic efforts and there is some kind of a moment of truth is arriving there are hundreds of treaties they're not compulsory nevertheless they've been signed and later when it became clear that this machine is unmanageable they decided to make a compact set of agreements they decided to make a realistic customs union then build on to that a set of harmonized uh, rules for macroeconomic policy, competition, investment, trade and services, and uh, movement of um, workforce. So they decided to create an economic union to ensure four freedoms, like in the EU, freedom of movement of goods and services, capital and people, workforce. And they wanted to do it quickly. The task is ambitious, but it's quite clear. There's a lot to discuss with business circles. Some things are controversial. The, nevertheless, the dialogue is ongoing and we'll be very happy to be briefed with the leaders of the projects, which will happen the day after tomorrow in the forum. And uh, so what is happening in the CIS and the, in the context of the customs union? Do you know that in international law, CIS cannot even be classified as an integrational grouping? Look at Article 24 of GATS. It follows that integration can be discussed only if two countries or a group of countries have created a customs union or a free trade area. Uh, there is no customs union in the CIS. There is no free trade area in the CIS. What there is uh, is a number of bilateral agreements. We know that negotiations are underway. Russia, Belarus, and Kazakhstan may, in fact, distance themselves from the rest of the CIS in time as they develop their closeness when they feel realistic economic, um, tangible economic benefits from free trade and they will use all their resources investment policy uh, to uh, consolidate their their efforts within the Troika. Then Ukraine, Moldavia, uh, Armenia, Azerbaijan will talk about free trade with the EU, gradually moving towards the EU and they will lose production links that are decades old and they will lose some of their markets. Do the leadership of these countries understand all the risks of this scenario? Are they not worried of having a one-on-one -on -one battle with the EU business? Do they really want this unbalanced construction in the EU? Because in many countries of the EU, there are many Eurosceptics. Now, Russia and, e and the EU, outside this um, infamous Eastern Partnership are happy to start negotiations on free trade. It's written in the agreement of 94. And uh, one last condition has to be fulfilled. Russia has to join the WTO. Uh, the possibility remains. Uh, it can either join together with Kazakhstan and Belarus or just before them. And both parties should be keen to start these, these negotiations, but it will confuse the situation even more because there will be a cumbersome system of parallel agreements with a number of partners on the same subject. It will be good for the lawyers, of course, because they'll have a unique opportunity to interpret the same circumstances in different ways. Now look at Central Asia, Kyrgyzia, Tajikistan. They're interested in the customs union. And I think uh, once we have tackled the most difficult problems in the region, they will join. The most problem, the biggest problem for them is to find, is to find resources to maintain a border, the external border. But Turkmenia and Uzbekistan, who would have to surrender certain national sovereignty to the customs union, they of course will be left outside this union. So we have to think of strategic partners, we have to think of priorities of our long-term economic policy, we'll have to think of external markets, and uh, they will have to take all these decisions independently in conditions of severe competition in the Asia-Pacific region. And the last thing is that if this scenario is carried through, would mean gradual degrading of the CIS. It's gradual disintegration. It will, be, it will cease to be an important and realistic uh, foreign economic union. Once it loses its economic component and content, it will lose its political effectiveness. Eurasia will end up broken up into a, a, set, of, a set of regions. I think most of us want a strong Eurasia. I'm sure that our regional and 
extra regional business. There are colleagues here from international companies in the room. They, for a long time, wanted to have a clearer picture of our common future in terms of transnationals. You cannot work in Russia and do business in Russia without thinking of Central Asia. You can't work in the Ukraine without thinking of Russia. You can't be based in one of the EU countries and you can't think of your future growth towards the East. And re the reverse is also true. Any company from the CIS needs to know uh, relative uh, trading conditions with the EU and with Russia. In uh, the Institute of Modern uh, Development and in the Russian Union of Industrials, we have uh, finished our analysis where we have formulated some simple conclusions. The CIS is necessary for its participants. Not a single CIS participant uh, doesn't want it at whatever price. And there are alternatives for their national development. Conclusion number three, to survive, the CIS must offer its participants a project which is clear and understandable, a project for mutual and uh, joint development, modernizing and balancing national interests with a special role of Russia in terms of confidence building uh, measures because it has to be, a, uh, because this post-imperial syndrome is very strong and we must understand this, we have a particular burden to carry here. And finally, the central element of this project would have a fully-fledged integrational group on the basis of CIS, which will not be viable if it doesn't create conditions for joint economic or common and economic space in Eurasia based perhaps on a strategic alliance between Russia, CIS, and the EU. If any of you is interested all of the panelists have this book, and we can give you a copy if you come up to us. Thank you for your attention.